chapter 1, 6 through 18, and today's title is called Companionship. Ruth 1, 6 to 18. I read the word to you guys, and afterwards when I say um, the word of the Lord, if you guys can respond by saying thanks be to God. Let me read this. And then she arose with her daughter-in-law to return from the country of Moab, For she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughter-in-law, and they went out on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, Go, return each of you to to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and rep. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. And if I should say that I have hope, and even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said, no more. These are the words of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Dear God, I just pray that you may open up our ears and our hearts to be able to receive your words. May you speak to us. May you move inside of us. May you comfort us and challenge us through your words. And may we hold on to your promises and seek you more and more each day of our lives. I pray, O Lord, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts may be holy and pleasing to you. I pray that your words and your gospel may be preached and your spirit may work in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, You know, last week we talked about how we are to respond when life happens. And I don't want to paint a dark picture of life. I mean, life certainly has many blessings. Life certainly has a lot of things to celebrate, a lot of things to adore adore and also enjoy. And we must have gratitude and thanksgiving for them, for God does call us to have thanksgiving in all of life's circumstances. But we also know that life, especially looking at Naomi's life, doesn't always work out the way we dreamed it would or the way we kind of planned it out. It doesn't always, it's not always rainbows and butterflies, but a lot of times it comes with some storms. And last week we learned that Naomi's family, her husband and her two boys, um, because of economic hardship, moved to a land called Moab, who's your daddy, uh, which it means. And they go out and they live the immigrant life. And after that, like when things couldn't get worse, the father, Elimelech, dies. Naomi is forced to be a single mother of two boys. The boys eventually get married. But short-lived, they don't have any kids, and they die as well. And in just the five verses, we see how three women become widows. And in the midst of all this, last week we talked about how God in these moments, when life happens and suffering is right in front of our face, he he doesn't tell us to man up or to sweep it under the rug, but he actually gives us permission to cry out to him. And we see this with Naomi. She cries out. She's honest with her, her pain. Faith is not the act of acting like we're stronger than we are, but it's simply coming to God. It's wrestling with him, just running with him, coming with all of our doubts and all of our hard questions and struggling with him. And in that process, finding God holding on to us. And, you know, when I was um, just, just, just reading this passage and, and, and meditating over the sermon, uh, you know, a scene from Lord of the Rings came up into my head. And as you guys might know, Lord of the Rings is, is basically about this little hobbit that 
is on a mission to drop a ring inside of, you know, Mount, the Mount Doom, I believe, to destroy a ring that is, you know, too powerful people, for people to handle. But in going um, on, on the road, he has a deep conversation with one of his friends named Sam Y. Gamgee, and he says this. Frodo says, I can't do this, Sam. Then you imagine the little guy say, I know. It's all wrong. By rights, we shouldn't even be here, but we are. It's like in the great stories, Mr. Frodo, the ones that really mattered, full of darkness and danger they were, and sometimes you didn't know, you didn't want to know the end, because how could the end be happy? How could the world go back to the way that it was when so much bad had happened? But in the end, it's only a passing thing, this shadow. Even darkness must pass. A new day will come. And when the sun shines, it shines out the clearer. Those stories that stayed with you, that meant something, even if, they, if we were too small to understand why. But I think, Mr. Frodo, I do understand. I now know. Folks in those stories had a lot of chances of turning back, only they didn't, because they were holding on to something. And then Frodo stops for a moment, and he says back and asks, what are we holding on to, Sam? What are we holding on to? Let me ask you guys, what do you hold on to? What do you hold on to? I mean, just imagine yourself in that position, the weight of the world on your shoulders. You're wanting to give up, a lot of obstacles, a lot of enemies, people wanting to see your downfall. What are you holding on to? You know, today's sermon really is a a reminder that, one, there is only one thing you can actually hold on to, one that gives you real hope. You know, a lot of times people think that faith is some like optimism where you're like smiling and be like, oh, things are gonna be great. Look on the brighter side. But real faith, real faith is hope in something certain, something that is promised. And not all promises are equal. Promises, you know, it's really dependent on who's actually making the promise. I can make you a lot of promises. Doesn't mean that it means anything. Promises are as strong as the person who gives it and who has the ability to keep it. It's dependent on who gives it. And, you know, you know, that's something that we, we got to remind ourselves. But, you know, this scene doesn't just remind us that there is a hope that we can hold on to and a hope that actually means something. But it also shows us oftentimes who God shows that hope through, who God uses to help us, helps us through these hardships. You know, about the scene, you know, I'm not looking at it, you know, like, man, a guy like Sam Y. Gamgee, you know, like yeah, Frodo is always highlighted. But if you really actually look at the movie, it's. Man, it's, it's Sam that gets them through everything. Frodo's like complaining the entire way. Like, I can't do this, Sam. And it's Sam, you know. But it shows us something, you know. Without a companion, without a community, without someone to walk with, without a friend, without a church, without a family, without our God who walks with us, who became Emmanuel, a God with us, life is impossible. It's impossible. And this for, you know, God is calling us to minister to one another, to stir each other up in hope and good deeds, to sing praises, to sing psalms to one another, encourage and build each other up. Why? Because we can't do it alone. A lot of times we're called to be Christ to each other. You know, and I feel like the scene in Lord of the Rings, as, you, know, is, you know, is really reflecting our passage today. And we're about to read one of these things kind of happen. Naomi just had a bunch of bricks thrown at her and every single one hit her pretty hard. And she's, she's a, you know, you know, just our small group yesterday, we're like, I want to be like Naomi. I'm like, oh, I don't know why you, why would you want to be like Naomi? She is complaining right now. She is bitter. She's mad. She's about to lose her faith. And you see it all throughout this entire passage. She's struggling with life. I mean, she's an old immigrant woman with no husband, with no sons, with no grandchildren. She's pretty much at the end. And at this moment, she's actually looking to, to Orpah and she's looking to, to Ruth and saying, I can't do this, Sam. I can't do this. I can't do it. So let's dive in, you know, what's actually going on? In verse 6, it starts off by saying this. And then she arose with her daughter-in-law to return from the country of Moab. For she heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law. And they went on their way to return to the land of Judah. I mean, notice right off the bat, God's sovereignty is still at play. She never for a moment doubts that. She's saying, hey, God has brought back food to Bethlehem. 
The famine came, but God brought it back. And after hearing this, no, uh, this news, she's getting all ready. Maybe they're packing their bags. They're tying up loose ends. They're about to go back to the land of Bethlehem or to the city of Bethlehem. And now while on the road, uh, maybe you imagine they're at the kind of the city limits, maybe the borders or something like that. Naomi turns around and she wants to take care of one last thing before she leaves. She looks to her daughter-in-laws and she says, go, each of you to your mother's house. And the Lord may Lord deal kindly with you as you guys have dealt kindly with the dead and with me. And the Lord may grant you rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. And she kissed them, and they all started crying. You guys got to kind of imagine this scene. They, they said that they cried and lift up their voices about two times throughout the passage. I imagine they're like, you know, boogers are coming out. I don't know. They, they're all crying. They're probably doing the, the thing, you know, where it's extremely annoying when you're just trying to get to the point. But anyways, they're doing that. They're crying. And she looks up to their daughter-in-laws and says, hey, you're, you're free to go. Go. It's the end of the road. You don't have to bother yourself with an old woman like me anymore. I'm not going to hold you down. You guys are both still young. You guys are both still young widows. You can go out. There's a chance that you might be able to get remarried. Go back to your family. Start all over again. But something that we often miss in this text, you know, and you have to know like the, the, the weight of the words that God uses in this. It says she blesses them in the name of the Lord. She turns around, doesn't just bless them, say God bless. She actually blesses them in the name Yahweh in the name of the Lord, not any just kind of a general wishing of luck, but she blesses them with the name of God. In addition, she blesses them using a very special word saying, may the Lord deal kindly with you. This deal kindly, this, this, or also known as hesed in, in, in the Hebrew language, is a unique word that says love and loyalty, like steadfastness, commit, commitment, sacrifice, all into one, and it, it pounds it into it. It's the very word that they used about God's love towards them. The community knew that this was God's love towards them. One commentator, Caroline James, for this definition, wrote this. Hesed is a one-way type of love. A love without an exit strategy. When you love with headset love, you bind yourself to the object of your love, no matter what the response is. Your love to the person, the person is entirely independent of how that person has treated you. It's kind of like one of those stubborn loves that won't let you go. And the entire Israelite community knew this word because it's always used upon them. But she is blessing them with that same love and goes on to say, may the Lord's blessings be upon you. Go out, find another husband, and make your life new again. Naomi, again, has fully convinced herself that all good gifts come from God. Now, you're probably not catching what's happening, but Naomi at this moment is not just blessing with her words. She's blessing with her very actions. See, technically, these two women are still obligated to her. When you got married, you would tie your relationships to, 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 to all, all the old relationships, to all your families, and you would glue yourself to a new family. They had their allegiance to her. But here she's basically saying, forget about all obligations. I free you. Go. You know, they say misery often loves company. I mean, have you guys ever met those types of people? When they're miserable, they want you to be miserable too. They'll bring you down with you. This is why when you're around bitter people, you often leave feeling bitter. You know, it just eludes from them. They want to take you down. You know, I once knew a woman in her mid-40s who never got married and, and lived with her parents almost like a child. Um, I think she's almost in her 50s now. But it's interesting because no one said it, but everyone knew it. Everyone knew it in the community. And I'm sure there's more to the picture. I don't want to judge. But most people knew it was because of the mother. She wouldn't let her go. In fact, like, I, I remember it was, I was blown away by the story. Her mom actually moved in with her when she went off to college. Moved in with her. Left the father, moved in with her, for, lived with her for a few years throughout college. And then they all moved back. And then she never left her mom. And everybody knew why that was the case. She would, the mom didn't want to be lonely. She didn't have a great relationship with her dad. And she was like, you're going to be with me. And she even shoot away some suitors. But, I mean, you look at this. Naomi has nothing to do with something like this. In fact, she was trying to get them away from her. She was like, I don't want my bitterness to rub off on you. Get away from me. But you got to realize, without her daughter-in-laws, Naomi would be utterly lonely she would have no chances for her future. She's old now. She's just a widow without any inheritance or any rights. You know, but after this, the daughter-in-laws are like, no, we'll stay with you. But Naomi basically turns around and gives them every single reason why they shouldn't be with her. I mean, you look at verses 11 to 13. She basically turns and says to them, 
why would you follow me? Don't follow me. I mean, what are you going to do? See, she's actually referring to one practice back then um, where usually if there's a widow and the husband of an Israelite person dies, um, the brother of that guy that just died would marry, would marry that wife so that whatever kids would come out from that marriage, those kids would receive the same inheritance that was due to the father. So it's kind of redeeming the family. So a widow would marry the, the, her, her dead husband's brother so that, that that line would kind of continue. It was a type of social security net for, for widows. So, um, but, and this meant that back in the day, that back, uh, back in Bethlehem, they probably had something to get. You know, Elimelech, Naomi's dead husband, probably had some inheritance that could be restored. But at this moment, she was like, you know what? The chances were so slim. You know what? Go. Don't be with me. I don't need it. What would possess you to stay with me? She's basically saying, you want to take your chances with me? You just saw my two sons die. I don't have any more coming. I'm old. I'm past the age of having more kids. I don't even have a husband. Nor, nor will I, no one will marry me at this age. And she's basically even stating the hypotheticals. Like, even if I were to have kids right now, twins for both of you guys, are you guys going to wait 18 years? 18 years and then get married to them? It's like, no chance. No chance. You're not going to do that. No, daughters, is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of God is against me. She was like, you know what? God's hand's against me. I don't want you to have anything to do with me. Go, go. God is obviously not working in my life anymore. I give up, go. And then they cry together for a while. But you know what's amazing about the story? It's amazing that in the hardest moments for Naomi, even in her own bitterness towards God, even when she's feeling very cursed by the very hands of God, this woman turns around and blesses them with the same name of God that she thinks has just cursed her. She sits down, prays with them, holds her hand and says, I wish the best for you. But you know what's even more compelling about the story is that Naomi knew she had chances. I really, I'm really convinced that she knew. You know, she knew that it wasn't only her sons that they could get married to. It could be, they could marry, be married to a distant relative and that she can feel the same, 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 same blessings or, or the same inheritance. You know, I wondered for a while, I was like, why didn't she tell her daughter-in-laws at this moment? Why did she only point to her sons? That was the impossible, impossible route or impossible op- option. You know, they didn't know any, have any knowledge of the laws in Bethlehem. Probably not. Why would she do that? And then I was looking at this. I'm like, huh. You know, some scholars were like, she probably forgot because she was all bitter. But for me, I'm just like, no, I think she knew exactly what she was doing. I mean, a brother of a widow would do this out of obligation, but relatives, I mean, who's going to marry the Moabite? She knew that the chances were so slim that she was like, you know what? Even if I do have chances, I'm not going to let you ride on this boat because these chances are so small. I mean, you know, have you guys ever like had, had a parent that would do the same way? Like you want to bless the parent, but if there's any chance of you being hurt by it, they wouldn't go toward, towards it, you know? Like they would risk losing out on everything themselves as long as their loved ones are, are, are taken care of. Like literally, they'll say what Naomi says, right? Don't worry about me. I'm fine. My life, I know it's hard. But that's just how it is for me. It's okay. My sacrifices, if they can help you, build on it. Build on it. Don't worry about me. Go fly. You know, and, and even as Naomi as a mother, mother-in-law, you know that she views them in that type of way because she addresses them in a, in a very intimate way. She says, my daughter's. Turn back, my daughter, she says it three times. She could have said daughter-in-laws, but she says my daughters. And you're looking at this, man. You know, and when you're looking at the responses, you know, Orpa basically kisses her and says goodbye. She leaves. But Naomi clings. And you know, a lot of times people, I've heard people preach like, oh, look at the disobedience or disloyalty of Orpa, and look at the awesome, awesome loyalty of Ruth. But that's not the case Orpah is only mentioned not to look down upon, but that's the logical thing to do. I mean, if any of you guys, your husband dies and, and you know, your mother-in-law is the end of the road and she's just a bitter person, are you going to be like, I'll stay with you to the end? Oh, well, none of you guys. I don't know, maybe some of you guys with the niceness of your heart. But it's not the logical thing to do. In fact, by any standard, she was doing the right thing, the wise thing. I mean, I think I would have done that. You calculate the cost. But her leaving told it's not highlighted to display her disloyalty, but it's highlighted to explain how crazy Ruth's response is. And our, our, our text goes on to say Ruth clings on. 
And Naomi tries to get her off being saying, oh, your daughter-in-law, your, your sister-in-law left, so you just go with her. But she was like, no. And then she responds by saying this. I mean, this is probably one of the most poetic and beautiful lines in the Bible that's often um, said at weddings and things like that. And if there's anything that you guys know from the book of Ruth, this is probably the one that you heard. Um, but, you know, Shakespeare got nothing on, this, on, on Ruth, you know. Let me read this to you guys. Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. And your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me. And more also, if anything but death parts me from you. My gosh, if they want to cry just reading this, I wish I could say this to my wife. (laughs) I did. I'm still working on the belief part, though. But, you know, I sat there for, for a while, like, wondering what the heck just happened. What would possess a young woman in her prime age to cling on to this old woman? You know, maybe in one sense I could be like, oh, yeah, she's just a very faithful person. But I think there's more to it. And maybe Ruth, maybe she had nothing left and she was like, ah, you know, I might as well take my chances with you. I got nothing back at home. But, you know, there's something that, that there's some really important lessons that I think we can glean from this. Oftentimes when faith and love are planted, it's often reaped. When faith and love are planted, it's often, it often has returned. You know, faith that we have during hardships and our, and our suffering moments often becomes seeds that we plant into the faith of someone else. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know that, I, I never knew that the book of Ruth in this particular scene was you know, one of the few verses, one of the few passages that Jewish rabbis would tell stories of how outsiders would come into God's kingdom. There's actually only two explicit conversion stories all throughout the Old Testament, and, and they're both women. One is Ruth and one is Rahab. Rahab was a prostitute in the book of, of Joshua, and now Ruth is a Moabite, but they become into the covenant family. But two things come into play for this conversion to happen, and I think this might teach us a little bit about what evangelism, how that might be played out. It's, it's really simple. Faith and love. Faith and love. Have faith. Watch what you hope in. And show love. You know, at first I was like, no way. Naomi is like the worst evangelist ever. I mean, look at this. Basically says, and you know, even at one point she says, go back to your gods. You know, return after your sister-in-law. Go back to your gods. Not to mention she goes on and saying, hey, God brought all these bad things into my life. God can make, God made me better. He took everything from my life. Imagine doing evangelism like this. You know, every time we do evangelism, we try to paint the be- most beautiful picture of church. We have, like, moon bounces outside and be like, invite people, you know? <laughs> like, they'll love church. And then, you know, the next week, none of that's there. And, like, you don't have food every week? And anyways, I mean, imagine you inviting your neighbors to, to church or, uh, you know, something like that. And, and you say, hey, by the way, you want to come to church? You want to believe in Jesus? And if you do, you know, God might take away everything that you care about. Um, by the way, you know, he might tell you to forfeit all the good things in life. Life might be really, really bitter. But hey, you want to follow Christ? Want to follow my God? <laughs> You'd be like, oh. But you know what's crazy? You know what's crazy? The church has always flourished when they had nothing. And may- maybe this is where people see what true faith is. But let me ask you guys. It's not so, it's not so, so far from, from our imaginations, right? What faith... Or what type of relationship impresses you guys the most? Are they the perfect ones where, you know, you, you, you watch like, you know, MTV Cribs and, you know, this is my wifey and they got everything. Is that, is, that, is that what you look at and be like, oh, with that beautiful relationship? No, you actually just look at what they have and say, oh, I must be lucky. But you don't really look at the relationship. I mean, things might be impressive, but not the relationship. You know, there's something about it, right? When you look at everything going right, You assume that it's something else. You're like, oh, your life has many blessings. I'd believe in God, too, if he did all that for me. Or, shoot, your husband bought you a mansion and a Bentley and unlimited credit card use. Shoot, I'll be a faithful wife, too. But you know what moves our heart? You know what moves our heart? No one is actually impressed with that type of thing. But what moves our heart and what brings us to wonder is when love looks like it should be impossible, but it's there. Like the husband who cares for his wife, even though they're going through dementia and she doesn't even remember his name, yet he serves and loves her for the rest of her life. And you know, the world sees this. 
the world sees this. You know, just the other day, um, I saw a news feed about Justin Bieber's wedding, and, and they're like, oh, they played the notebook for their thing. And I'm like, huh, interesting. And I was like, what was the notebook about? And I was like thinking about it. I was like, shoot, it's exactly that story. You know, a man, a woman goes through a dementia, and they, they die together, and, and she serves, serves them for the rest of their life. And, you know, they want that. They want to emulate it. I mean, that moves their heart, right? See, there's an analogy to be drawn, not perfectly, but it highlights the relationship more than what you get out of the relationship. And Naomi, even in her bitterness, held on to God. I mean, it wasn't perfect. She wasn't happy. She went through her frustrations. But I'm so sure that Ruth saw it. Do you know why? Because Naomi, you guys, you guys check this out. This is so deep. I was like, I was like, ha oh. like, ha. I, I got like shivers, you know? Naomi goes to her and says, let my God's blessings be with you. May your life be awesome. She basically gives her a prosperity lesson saying, go out, God's, may God bless you. But you know what Naomi does? She turns around and says, I don't want those blessings. I want what you have. I want what you have. I, 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 I want to go where you go. I'm going I'm to lodge where you lodge. I want your God to be my God. And you know, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like oh, Naomi, I mean, oh, Ruth, like, are you insane? But it resonates with my heart. You know, if I look at my own life, I, I see that my faith has always been planted by watching the faith of people when they are struggling. You know, it's, it's, it's not a coincidence. You know, my mom, my, my mom is a, a widow too, and I, she dragged me to so many morning prayer meetings, like, dragged me to so many things. Like, I remember, like, these crazy ladies praying over me, and, and, my mom went to morning prayer so much that when I, when I snuck out, I came back before 5 o'clock because I know she would wake up and check up on me. You know, I knew that, so I came back at 5 a.m. I seen her in her moments of pain raising three kids on her own. But you know what? That made it real for me. Sure, people are going to be like, hey, oh, perfect life. You know, I got all, all the nice things in life. My marriage is perfect. Oh, God is my God. No, I really, I really think, you know. It's a testimony of God often works. If you look at the Christian movement, it always spreads under persecution. It happened in Rome when the Christians were martyred. People were like, they're being martyred, but they're, they're blessing others. It happened in South Korea during the Japanese occupation. Christians were tortured to recant their faith. It happened in China with the, with, the, with the government persecuting the church, and more churches were planted. It happens in the Middle East where Christian converts are executed. And under the scenes, they say so many people are coming to Christ. In fact, it's always the peace times when Christianity has power in places like Europe and America where it loses its attractiveness. You know, we really don't grow into happy moments, and it sucks that we don't. It really does. But we grow during the hard ones. But there's more to this picture, you see. Naomi not only just held on to her faith in those moments, but she turns around and uses her faith to bless others. She shows love. She shows faith and love. And I don't know if Naomi is doing this consciously. I don't know if she had it in her heart, like, oh, I want to convert them. I don't, I don't think she did. I think she was just living life. But, you know, this is, but this is oftentimes it's so true. You know, faith is caught. It's not taught. Naomi didn't go on to preach and be like, oh, come with me to my land, and God's going to show you his faithfulness. She didn't say that. No, she genuinely cared for the other person. She says, go, leave me. I don't want you to hurt. I don't want you to face what I'm facing. And then it comes around, and then she gets this love poem, you know? She plants faith, she plants love, and she re in return, she gets faith, and she gets love in Naomi. And I talk about companionship. I mean, this is, this is the real thing. You know, the one that we really want in our hearts, that has said love, that one-way thing, that committed companionship type of relationship, a love that our hearts desire. And guys, this companionship that you see in these two women, they're really a small picture of our relationship with Jesus. You know, I never get why people say, the, oh, Christianity must be a made-up thing, you know? I mean, if I were to make up a religion, I'd do far better than that, you know? I'd do cross as a symbol, you know? The execution chair is a symbol, do the dollar sign, you know, that'd be a lot better. You know, rappers got more followings than any pastor. But Christianity says, look at our God. He suffers. He dies on the cross. He becomes human just like us. He suffers. He dies. I mean, it was so countercultural back then where Paul looks at it and says, yo, it's foolishness to people who don't believe. It's foolishness for those who don't see God, but it's salvation for those who get it. Because in that suffering, you know, we see the motifs all over the place. 
you know, Christ's utter obedience to God, holding on to something worth dying for. I mean, we see this, the sacrifice he's willing to give for the benefit of someone else. Gosh, in so many ways, you see them both preach Christ to one another. Naomi preaches it to Ruth in her own way, in her own bitterness, by simply holding on, by blessing and loving. And Ruth goes back and she preaches it in a different way. Ruth says the promises that God promises to us, right? I'll never leave you. I'm going to go where you go. I'm going to lodge where you lodge. I'm going to die where you die. I'm going to be your companion through thick and thin. And it shows what true companionship does, you know, and something we emulate with our lives. True companionship preaches Christ to each other. And it's not just with words. It's with action. It shows it. It places oneself at a disadvantage for the sake of another. It sacrifices oneself for the benefit of the other. And they're both doing this to each other. And I just want to challenge you guys. Ruth's commitment to Naomi here at the heart of it is not out of their own strength, but it begins with a commitment to God, which enables them to do this. You know, if there's anything that you guys leave this sermon with, it's really simple. Will you commit to God in the same way that Ruth has committed to Naomi? Because Christ has done that for you. Will you commit? Will you follow? Will he be your companion? He says, I'm going to be there with you. I'm not going to promise you the best uh, of this world right now, but there is redemption to come and it is better than anything you can imagine. The best is yet to come. You know, I'm going to invite the praise team up as we get into this last point. You know, it's really interesting to see the parallels because Jesus was equally a horrible evangelist. I mean, he goes and says, hey, if you want to follow me, you've got to hate your family, leave everything and follow me. And in Matthew 16, 24, 26, he actually says this. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I mean, what a thing to say if you wanted people to follow you. Ah, but it's followed up. Verses 25 to 26 says this. For whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? You know, people didn't know what Christ was talking about at that moment, but they were able to see that in love, you know, what Christ would do. He would face the cross out of his love for his people. He would deny himself so that others may redeem them. I mean, will you follow this God? You know, I'm just going to end with reading Philippians chapter 2, uh, 1 through 8, because I think it really summarizes all this, or 1 through 11. And read this. I mean, this is such a, if you guys could just get this, I mean, this is, that's it. Let me read this to you guys. If there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord of the one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you not look only to his own interests, but also the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And therefore God has exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of the God the Father. Let's pray. Let's, let's take a moment just to pray.